everyone, my name is Rukia, Rukia Charles from Trinidad, um, coming to you from Alabama. I'm so excited to be with you today. Um, we have a list of things planned for you. We're going to show you how to do some kitchen cabinet remedies or how to use the things in your kitchen um, to make nice syrups and um, drinks that will help to boost your immune system. We're going to teach you how to use water um, as a therapy to boost the immune system again. And then finally, we're going to talk about how does our thoughts affect the body? Does that have anything to do with our immune system? Stay tuned for this hour to see and hear some really good information. Before we begin, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for all of these natural things that you've given us that we can use to um, prevent disease or to treat disease. And now as we use and uh, learn how to use all these things, Father, we pray that you will bless it, but we pray that you will give us wisdom. I pray that you will be with me as I instruct and that you will be with each listener, that they will find things that they can use um, in their homes to treat their own bodies and then tell their friends about it. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. To begin, I'm going to start with something that is so powerful um, but so simple to find. It's called charcoal, activated charcoal. You can find this um, really in any health food store. I'm going to show you how to use it in two main ways. Um, now charcoal can be used for a variety of things from insect bites and um, bee stings, for food poisoning, for nausea, even um, vomiting, for diarrhea. I mean the list just goes on and on. So we're going to show you how to use this um, in two ways. First I'm going to show you how to take it if maybe um, I had something going on internally. I have my charcoal here. I'm just gonna take a tablespoon of the charcoal. And you know what? I'm actually gonna add my water first. So we'll do about eight ounces of water. And then I'm gonna add a tablespoon of charcoal. I'm gonna mix that all around. And believe it or not, it may look kind of interesting, but it has no taste. I'm going to show you. All right, moving on to how can you use this externally. Let's say you got an insect bite or a spider bite or uh, a skin rash, maybe poison ivy. We're going to add some charcoal to our bowl. A lot of times it's better to add the water first, but I'm just going to add some charcoal here. That's sufficient since we're making a small, for well, a small application. I'm going to add a little bit of water. Okay, so we're making a charcoal poultice. And so I added so far, I added my charcoal and water. And to this, I'm going to add a binder. Um, today I'm using just regular a wheat flour. You can add flaxseed, um, even psyllium, but all I'm using, I'm using things that you can find at home. Alright, and immediately it began to thicken up, maybe even a little too much, so I'm going to add my water. Alright, now you want it to be not too runny, not too uh, thick, just like a paste. Alright, now there are many ways of applying this. This is a nice fancy um, incontinence pad and we kind of just open this part and put the charcoal in. But I'm going to show you how to do it with paper towel, things that you have at home. Alright, so I have my paper towel here. And I'm going to take two blocks off and I'm going to apply it. I'm actually going to make it even smaller. Here's my charcoal. I'm going to apply it right onto one side of the paper towel. I hope this doesn't break. And then I'm going to 
close it up see that there and then I'm gonna ask my client to come on down and now you can make this really nice put some tape around the edges especially if you're gonna sleep with it at night because charcoal does stain your linen so be careful of your clothing um, as you apply this so here I have my charcoal let's say she got a, a sting right there a bite I'm gonna apply that on and I have some saran wrap you don't have to use this you can use um, a sock even but again just remember that charcoal does stain um, uh, the clothing so apply this on and she can leave this on for four to six hours if we were dealing with an actual spider bite or ant bite even a snake bite um, we may want to change this every hour all right so that was the charcoal poultice so moving on to a second poultice or a second um, wrap that we can use this one again i'm focusing on the virus and how it can affect the lungs and so i'm teaching you how to make the onion poultice one of the most powerful wraps that we could use um, to help with congestion in the chest so i'm going to dice my onion up um, you can do this in different ways. You can put this in the food, pro food processor. Um, you can put it in the blender. Now it may get a little bit juicy if you put it in there, um, which is fine. But I'm just going to chop my onion up and I think that will be sufficient for now. Um, today I'm going to use this because I just showed you how to do it with the paper towel, the charcoal poultice. I'm going to show you how to do the onion in this nice little pad that we have here that you can also find from a local drugstore. Alright, so I'm going to add my onion to um, this pad that I've cut out, you know, to fit the chest. And this is nothing added, just the onion. If you could see that there. Just cut it up a little bit more. I'm gonna add that right into my, and I'm actually gonna ask my lady to come on up here and hold this in place for me. We're going to seal the edges with some tape. This onion poultice is to help relieve congestion in the chest. So we're even looking at things like pneumonia, bronchitis, maybe even asthma. Um, this poultice, this remedy can be used for it. sealed inside but you could see that it's kind of moving around in there in order to prevent that as well as to really get those juices out I'm gonna just go over it with a rolling pin you could do this in the fruit processor right and just apply it onto your cloth I'm gonna really crush it in there going to apply it to the chest um, so I'm going to call Talakla up to apply it to her chest I'd actually warm this um, you can warm it in the microwave for a short couple seconds um, or however you choose to do it um, warm this application and then we're going to put it right onto the chest Hold for me. and 
you can use again you can use um, an ace bandage you can use a um, shirt a tight fitting shirt then we can apply our uh, wrap and she can sleep with it she can sleep with this all around the body and she can sleep with this overnight or it can apply for four to six hours until um, she feels better this is the onion poultice Many of the symptoms associated with the virus, COVID-19, um, affect the lungs. So today we're gonna show you two uh, natural remedy recipes that you can use not just to relieve a cough or a cold or chest congestion, but to prevent any type of um, upper or lower uh, respiratory condition. First, I'll start with a really simple cough syrup. All you need is some lemon juice that we've already squeezed here, some honey, onion, ginger, and then uh, a couple drops of eucalyptus. Now this is optional. It really gives it that extra um, boost to the cough syrup. If you didn't have this, just go ahead and use your lemon, uh, honey, and onion. But we're gonna put everything together. So first, I already have my pot here. I'm gonna start by warming my lemon juice. I'm gonna put this in here. It's about one cup of lemon juice. One cup of lemon juice to two tablespoons of honey. The onion, we're not gonna measure it. It's just as you can put as much or as little as you um, would like and then a sliver of garlic so we'll just wait for our lemon juice to begin to boil a little bit so I've added my lemon juice and it's to a nice simmer we don't want to cook it kill it um, but we just want it warm enough to pull out some of the properties in our foods so that's about one cup of lemon juice then I'm gonna add to that two nice tablespoons of honey. One, two, all right. I'll show you what this looks like in a, in a minute here. To this simple we're gonna add a couple pieces of onion you can use the red onion if you like today I'll be using the white onion. and I'm just putting big chunks of it in there all right a piece of ginger smells pretty good this is great for children doesn't have a bad taste compared to maybe the next one that we'll be making and then a couple drips of uh, eucalyptus so just not too many maybe two or three drops all right I'm gonna let that Take the stove off and I'm gonna let that steep for one minute so we're all done here we have our syrup you can see the pieces of the onion still in here and you can drink this as much as you need um, a tablespoon at a time maybe over 24 hour period here you go. For our second recipe, we're going to just put everything into the blender and it's ready to go. Uh, we're using very similar ingredients to the uh, first recipe that we did, the cough syrup. And this is called, we call it nature's penicillin. Um, so we'll be using uh, 
onion. Today we'll be using the red onion, one onion, lemon, one grapefruit, one uh, orange, and then some cloves of garlic. Very, very simple. So I've already prepared my fruit. Um, you can cut it smaller if you like. Okay, I'm just gonna put the chop in here. Add my onion. I'm gonna add my grapefruit. And you recognize I kept some of the white on there. Kind of changes the taste, but uh, it's better, they say, with the white stuff on there. The bitter, the better. My lemon. But it can last up to three to five days refrigerated. So if you're, it's the flu season and you're either taking it as a preventative measure or you're taking it to treat the flu, um, it may be good to just make a, a big jar of it. Here I have my orange. And then lastly, I'm just gonna use a couple cloves of garlic in here. All right. And now you blend. Okay, so it's all blended. Can you see how beautiful it looks? Here we go. Our Russian penicillin. You can use this about a tablespoon, um, sometimes a tablespoon every hour for the first day of the flu. Um, for some, that may be a little strong. Um, so you can take it as needed, a tablespoon three times a day um, to help relieve any upper, upper or lower respiratory um, infections or uh, sicknesses. So now we're going to move over to the treatment room where we're going to demonstrate for you some simple hydrotherapy treatments. Today I'm going to teach you how to do three simple treatments that anyone can do at home. You could do this treatment if you feel like you're getting sick, um, maybe the cold, the flu, or if you're just tense and need uh, to re relax a little bit. Um, we're teaching you how to do hydrotherapy or water therapy. Hydrotherapy affects lots of different body systems, but two in particular, the nervous system and the circulatory system. Uh, we use water in its three main forms, liquid, solid, and gas. Uh, and a variety of temperatures to reduce or stimulate body function. So today we'll start with a really simple um, water treatment called the hot foot bath. The hot foot bath is exactly what it says it is. You're just putting your feet into hot water. Here I have my friend, Telepla. She's gonna help me um, demonstrate this treatment to you. We use everything that you have at home. We use a blanket, a blanket and a flat sheet. You don't have to use this. You can use two sheets, two blankets. We have another hand towel. I have a rag that I'm gonna use for her head. And then a basin for hot and cold water. So now we're gonna begin by asking her to put her feet into the water. If you want it to get really technical, you can have your thermometer here and start the water at about 104 degrees. I just ask her to put it in and see um, how hot, what's, what's her tolerance. She told me already that it's a little hot, so I can go ahead and add some ice, but are we okay? Yeah. Okay, we're okay for now. So we're just gonna put our feet into the hot water and then we're gonna wrap her up. I'll start with my flat sheet. I'm gonna put a towel around my neck just to kind of keep the heat in. And then I'm gonna use my blanket. Now as her feet is in the hot water, uh, the blood from the other parts of her body will um, 
will now rush to that area because heat causes vasodilation. So if there's any congestion of blood in the head, like a headache, or in the chest, or even in the pelvic region, menstrual cramps maybe, um, this treatment can relieve um, those types of things. Now, uh, we're just, it's a waiting game. Now we're gonna just make her comfortable. This treatment can go for about 15 to 20 minutes. During this time, she, you can imagine she'll begin to sweat because it's hot water at her feet, as well as she's wrapped up to her hot in there. <laughs> it's hot in this room as well. And during that time, we're going to also keep her head cool with some ice water that I've prepared here. If she needs it, I'll bring it out nice and tight. And we'll dab her head when she needs it. I'll give her some water to drink because she's been sweating. And um, you know, this as she <laughs> this as she feels, uh, she'll let us know what she needs. Uh, most important thing about this treatment is that we want to start with prayer. We know that God can work through these natural things, and we want to invite His presence to um, to work through this treatment. Now, at the end of this treatment, so she's wrapped up, you can even, I didn't mention, but you can even add some hot water to her feet as you go along. Let me show you how you do that. You can ask her to put her feet maybe to one side. body nice and warm, keep circulation um, going to kind of uh, mobilize the white blood cells that are in her body to come out and fight the infection or the cold, the flu, whatever she's experiencing. And at the end, so 20 minutes is up, we always end with cold. And we can tell that our lady is ready to go. So we're going to unwrap her. Now, if we were really doing this treatment for her, she would have on something minimal, you know, underneath. And if she was sweating on her arms, I would wipe her down with the cold. Like this. Right? Just wipe her entire body down with the cold. But really what you want to focus on is the feet. All right? So I'm gonna ask her to stretch her feet all the way up, as much as you could. You can use this cold rag to end with cold. I'm gonna put it on her feet, like this. Or you can take the cold water that we were using before and pour it on. Make sure to always end with cold. Go ahead and put your feet up here. So from here, we'll put some socks on and then she'll go to bed to rest for about 30 minutes. That was the hot foot bath. This treatment is called the fomentation treatment. This treatment can be used for lower, any lower respiratory condition, maybe any symptoms associated with um, the virus, uh, anything that has to do with the lungs, the chest, um, this fermentation treatment can be used for that. Um, it can be done to a particular area, one specific area, um, versus the treatment that we did before, the hot foot bath. The entire body is involved. This one we're focusing on in on the chest, um, but it can be done on different joints, really any part of the body, the knees, um, the back. Today we're gonna do it for the chest. Let's say our client has a cough, uh, bronchitis, um, pneumonia, maybe just some congestion, upper respiratory congestion. The fomentation, it's a big fancy word for 
uh, this here, this is what we use at our center. Um, I, I think it's a piece of wool that's been sewn together. But if you don't have this at home, we're going to teach you how to do it with some towels. Here I have just a regular bath towel. Um, I'm going to fold it into a nice square. I take it over to my tap, the water, and I'm going to soak it as much as possible. I'm going to go over there and do that now. All right, so my towel is nice and wet. Not dripping, as you can see, but pretty soaked. I'm gonna use a garbage bag, a regular garbage bag. I'm gonna have ask my client to help me here. Let me hold that for me. Right. I'm gonna kind of flatten it out, open in the in the bag. And in case you were wondering, if you were asking what type of water should I use, it doesn't matter. Hot water is better, but it doesn't particularly matter. Okay, so I put my towel in the bag, as you can see here, and I'm going to roll my bag up, towel and bag, and I'm going to stick this entire little package into the microwave, all right? So we're going to pretend that right here is the microwave. I'm going to stick it in there for about three minutes. You can do it for four minutes, five minutes, it would not burn. We just want that towel to get nice and hot. All right, so she's having a little bit of cough, right? Something going on in the chest. So we're going to do the hot and cold or the, the fermentation treatment to her chest. I'm going to begin by adding a layer um, so that the fermentation isn't directly on her skin. All right, I'm just using a towel. You can use a t-shirt, whatever you like. I have two layers here, right, because my towel is folded in two. You can do as you like here. And then I'm going to take my fermentation out of the microwave, a little convenient microwave, and put it right onto her chest. See that? And then I'm going to cover it up. And if she's really sick, you can cover the entire body. She's laying on the table here um, just so that I can access her chest really well. Um, it doesn't have to be done like this. Now we want to put the hot on for three minutes. Three minutes of hot and then we'll exchange that or we'll use, um, we'll remove the hot and add cold for 30 seconds. So this is kind of like a revulsive treatment. Three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold. Three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold. Um, this will increase circulation um, and help to remove the congestion that she may be experiencing in the chest. All right, so three minutes is up, hot, we're going to remove the fermentation. Now again, this should be done on the bare skin or over a very uh, thin garment. And I'll put this back into the microwave for three minutes. And I'm going to take my cold rag and apply it right onto the skin. Now, not over the towel. Gonna apply right onto the skin, right over the chest. Nice and briskly. 30 seconds. Alright. I like to have a rag that we can dry with. I don't have one right here, but we can dry the area off and then put the hot fermentation. Take my fermentation out of the microwave back on the chest for three minutes. All right, now, as I said at the beginning, this can be done on many different parts of the body. Today we're focusing on the chest, um, but this can be done, let's say, on the knees for arthritis, arthrit arthritic pain, or if I sprained my ankle. Um, we can do the hot and cold as well. Maybe instead of using a hot rag, we can actually just dip 
the ankle into hot for three of a basin of hot water for three minutes and then um, cold for 30 seconds. Let me do that one more time so you'll get to see it. Take the hot off. Put it back into the microwave or you can have a, a second one that you're working with. Take my cold and do what we call friction. All over the chest. We do this for about five times, five to seven times, or as much as the client needs it. Always communicate with your, um, with your client, asking them how they're feeling, do they feel better, um, and we always begin with prayer, as we said, and we always end with cold. So we would end with the cold friction. Just as in our first treatment, if the client is also um, sweating on the rest of the body, so the abdomen and the arms, maybe even the back, we're gonna wipe everything off with that cold rack. And that's the end of the fermentation treatment. This treatment is the easiest of all the water treatments to do. All you need is your shower. This treatment is like the number one treatment for boosting the immune system. You get the full body effect all at once. All you do is step into your shower, as our dear lady is here, and what we're going to do is begin with hot. Again, just start with your tolerance. I'm not gonna turn it on, but you turn the water on to warm, warm to hot as much as you can take it. And then we're gonna stay in there for about three minutes, just like our treatment, our fermentation treatment before. Gonna, you can turn around in the shower, make sure you get all the different parts of the body. And then after three minutes, we turn it over to cold. So you can pretend you're turning it over to cold. And as cold as you can take it, it may sound a little hard, but that's what you do. Turn it to cold for 30 seconds. After your 30 seconds is up, you turn back to your hot for three minutes. We do this for about five to seven times. That's as simple as it is, the contrast shower. One way to strengthen your immune system is to make sure that your body isn't stressed. We could do that in many different ways. We can do it by deep breathing, but we can also do it by getting a massage from a friend. Today, I'll be teaching you how to do a simple five minute back massage um, that you can do at home. So you can grab a friend now, maybe your spouse, a sibling, um, daughter, son, mother, father, and let's practice these strokes together. I have my friend here, Telekla, and she's set up on a nice chair, but I'll show you at the end how we could do this on a regular chair um, at home. All right, so don't worry about this fancy setup. First, I'll begin by just, uh, we call it introducing ourselves and our hands to the client's body by doing uh, what we call compressions. So just gently, not putting all of our body weight on there, but just enough. I know what it feels like and the client knows what my hands feel like. Compressions all along the back. Then we would go to a familiar word in massage called effleurage. Effleurage um, is where we do long strokes. So with the same amount of pressure as before, we're going to do long strokes, kind of warming her muscles up. Now when you're having, when you're doing a back massage, a lot of times the areas that will be really tense, the shoulders, maybe the back, and then a lot of times the lower back. So we're gonna focus on those areas. After our effleurage, we're going to do some petrissage or some kneading, squeezing motion, motions to the shoulder. And I'm just closing in my hands like this, fingertips or full hand to the shoulder on both sides. 
If you can't do it at the same time, you can do one shoulder at a time. And then the next shoulder. And you should, the client should begin to say, ah. Is that good? And here I'm just going down the side of her arm. Can do the other side as well, same as we did on that side. Make our way back up and we're going to do the same squeezing motion but with less pressure to the neck. Nice and gentle. Sometimes I stabilize the head. Gentle. That's called petrissage. All right, simple. Now we're gonna teach you how to do what we call thumb circles. Along the back, we have the spine. So you'll feel this bone here. We never wanna push on the bone. So we go right off to the, the sides of the bone. So this is it, we go up to the side here and the side here. Kind of plant our thumbs in and do a circle. Circle, circle, or like a twist, thumb twist. Again, to the client's tolerance. We never want her to feel uncomfortable, so we're always asking, how's our pressure? Does this feel good? And then we go right back up the back. Now we do the same thing, but with a full fist. Now, be careful not to use your knuckles. We're using the flat part of the fist, flat on the back, and we're twisting. Down the sides of the spine, never on the bone. I'm going to do that again. The lower back. All right. You don't have to do this part, but a lot of people like their head to be massaged as well. I'm just going to plant my fingers in, kind of like claws, and do gentle circles so that I don't really mess her hair up, no need to. And then I move my fingers and do it in a different area. I go right down to the scalp, so I'm mobilizing the scalp itself, increasing blood flow, releasing those tense muscles. Perfect. Now we end. We end with something called topotement. So I'm just using the tops of my fingers, gentle again, kind of to wake the body up. And then no stroke. And that's the end of your massage. So very, very simple. We started with compressions, effleurage, Petrissage to the shoulders, the neck. We did some twists to the back. We did fingers to the uh, neck. We massaged the scalp and then ended with tapotment and nerve stroke. So you can use a massage chair like you saw me demonstrate earlier. Uh, this is a simple one that you can get. This is low skill, low price. Um, as you see, my friend was sitting in this way on the massage chair. It's very comfortable and convenient. But if you don't have one of these at home, you can use a simple chair and you sit the same way, just like this. 
Now we'll have a talk by Ashwin, and he'll talk a little bit about how our minds or our thoughts affect our body. Um, if we've done everything, the natural remedies, the hydrotherapy, the massage um, for our bodies, but we really haven't learned how to adjust the way we think, will we really truly have complete health? Well, listen in next to see what he has to say. Hi everyone. My name is Ashwin Sukumaran, and I serve on the medical staff of Uchi Pines Institute here in Seal, Alabama. And I am thrilled that you're able to be with us uh, for this special presentation on how to enhance your immune system and your health using simple things that you can use at home. And as you saw earlier, the treatments are very simple. Hydrotherapy and using things that you can find around your, your kitchen, really. But there's one other aspect to health that's very important, and if we miss it, we are missing a large part of our healing and preventative process. And, and that is the issue of the mind, okay? So that's what I'd like to share with you uh, today. If you look at the global population, currently the earth is around seven billion, actually it's more than that, over seven billion people. And out of that, currently, over 11.3 million individuals have uh, confirmed cases of the coronavirus, the COVID-19, which is uh, so notorious in these days that we live in. Now, the interesting thing about that is that 6.1 million globally have recovered from the virus. That's about 54% of individuals who got the coronavirus uh, have recovered and, and prayerfully many more will recover. The thing about that is that there is no uh, drug or, or vaccine that's being uh, used, I should say, in a standardized way. So how is it that all of these people are able to recover without the miracle drug, right? And, and I'd like to propose that perhaps it's due to the immune system. All those individuals who go into quarantine, what happens when you're in quarantine? Well, you're resting, you're staying away from other people, it's true. But what is the thing that actually uh, helps one to recover from the virus? Well, it's one's own immune system, right? Our body has cells that are designed to attack and, and destroy things that do not belong in the body, foreign invaders such as bacteria and yes, even viruses and uh, things like cancer, or fungus. I mean, there's, there's the, the immune system is there to be able to protect us from these things, right? And, um, and, and, and so the fact that the, the coronavirus, uh, there are people who are recovering from the coronavirus tells us that the immune system does have the ability to fight it, right? So what we want to do is present things that will help enhance the immune system. So today we're going to talk about the link between the mind and the body, okay? So how our thoughts could potentially affect the way that our, our, our bodies respond, even at the cellular level, right? So I want to show you this study. It was published in the American Psychological Association, and they did a cross-section analysis of 118 individuals, uh, and, and these are people who had traumatic brain injuries, they had strokes, they had spinal cord injuries and, uh, and other things like that. And, and what they did was they found a way to quantify their uh, spiritual experience, okay? And so they, they looked at whether um, the person was having a positive spiritual experience, uh, specifically one characterized by forgiveness and then negative spiritual experiences. And what they found was that positive spiritual experiences and willingness to forgive are related to better physical health, while negative spiritual experiences are related to worse physical and mental health for individuals with chronic disability. So that's very interesting because this is not a, a religious publication, it's a medical study. And what they're saying is that people who have positive spiritual experiences are more likely to have better health they're more likely to recover more efficiently. Now that's, that's interesting. Now there was another study published in the American Journal of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and I'm just jumping to the conclusions, and what they found is that spirituality showed a strong association with both life satisfaction and quality of life. 
and it was a significant predictor of life satisfaction among rehabilitation subjects. So this is very interesting. Our medical studies are showing us that people who have a positive spiritual experience characterized by forgiveness physically recover better. And then we come across this quotation found in the book Councils on Health, page 324, paragraph 2. It says, Satan is the originator of disease, and the physician is warring against his work and power. Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. And then this part right here, which is absolutely mind-blowing, it says nine-tenths of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. Where is here? The mind. Very interesting. Nine-tenths, that's 90% of disease has its foundation in the mind. Now, why is that so significant? We're often gearing 90% of our efforts not towards the mind, but towards the body, which means we're missing 90% of the problem. If 90% of the issue is in the mind and only 10% the body, but we're gearing 90% of our efforts to the body, then that means we're only giving 10% to the mind when that's where the majority of the problem is. What if we approached it in a different way? What if we threw ma the majority of our efforts towards the mind? Not to say that there aren't physical symptoms, for sure. And that's why we're, we're going over these simple things that people can do at home. They, they deal with the physical issues, right? But all of that without dealing with the mind could be futile. Right. So let's let's get into it a little bit more. If we are to look at um, the way that the mind functions. Right. So here's my question. Is the mind and the brain the same thing? Many people say, yes, it's the same thing. But what if they were separate? Why do I say this? Well, a dead man has a brain, but a dead man does not have a mind, right? So our mind is our, our consciousness, our ability to think, right? What if it works like this? The mind, or the heart as some people call it, not this heart, you know, but the heart. The mind works through the brain, through the nerves, to the rest of the body. And the body gives feedback, right? The body gives feedback up to the nerves of the brain and then the mind must interact with the information in the brain. It's kind of like a computer. A computer has hardware and it has software. And one can't function without the other. They must work together, but they are not the same, right? They're two separate things. Now, if any part of this system is damaged, it will affect the other. For example, if the brain has physical trauma to it, the mind could have trouble communicating through the brain, through the nerves, to the rest of the body. Or, or let's say the nerves are damaged. Let's say you had diabetic neuropathy and your nerves were damaged. Your brain could have trouble communicating between uh, the nerves and the, and the body. Now, these things here, the brain, the nerves, the rest of the body, are essentially chemical in nature, right? It's chemistry. I mean, there are uh, vitamins and minerals and nutrients, all kinds of different things. I mean, in our brain, there's serotonin, there's dopamine, there's, you know, all kinds of different things. And, and, and of course, chemical things can be chemically adjusted. But what about the, the, the mind? Is that chemical? It's not chemical. It's not tangible. It's, in fact, spiritual. Now, chemical things, as I mentioned, we can alter with chemistry. So you can change your nutrition. You can change your exercise. You can change your water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest. You can even take medications or do surgeries or whatever. Those things will change the chemistry of our being, right? Our bodies, the brain, right? But what if the need is not chemical? What if the need is spiritual? The question is, what is then needed, right? Now, for the, for the body, of course, obviously, if you get the proper nutrition, we'll, we will thrive. We get enough exercise, drink enough water, get the sunshine, uh, have some self-control, get fresh air, get plenty of rest. All those things are, are, are vital for us having good health, right? But what if you're doing all those things, but the issue is not chemical? 
then we have a problem. The 90% of disease has its foundation where? Not in the chemistry, but in the spiritual. All right. Now, if we get down to the cellular level, right? Let's say this is a cell, if you just whoosh, cut it in half, and, and you see there's the different apparatus there. You have the nucleus, and you have the mitochondria, and the Golgi apparatus, and the endoplasmic reticulum, and all these different things. Now, the, the cell, one cell is, is more complicated than New York City, right? But a cell essentially functions like a factory, right? And, and in a factory, you need raw materials, such as nutrition, oxygen, water, whatever. And those raw materials that come into the cell are chemical in nature, right? And, and, and so, of course, the product that comes out of the cell is chemical. So if you have beta islet cells of your pancreas that might be producing insulin, for example, or, or, or glucagon or amylase, lipase, whatever, right? So those are chemical products that come because it, it is a, a chemical organ, right? And, and of course, these raw materials coming in and the products going out, which also includes waste product, travel through the blood. Leviticus 17, 11 tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood, right? So anything that compromises circulation can also compromise our health, right? Perfect health depends on perfect circulation. So if you're wearing clothes that are too tight or if you're not um, covering the extremities well enough so that, you know, the extremities might be too cold or... Uh, or, or because of the diet, the cholesterol is high and it's, it's uh, you know, you have plaque formation. Anything that compromises circulation will compromise your health, right? So it's very important to uh, have good circulation. Now, what else does a factory require in order to function? Right? Well, it needs an energy source, right? It needs power. And, and what is the energy source we think of in the body? Well, it's electricity. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, chi or aura or chakra. Those things are not scientific. Those are uh, man-made things that are tied in occultism. But I'm talking about real electricity that we have in our bodies. We have sodium, potassium, calcium. There's real electrical voltages, right, that are in our body. And we tend to think of those el electrical impulses as... Uh, happening in the brain and then traveling through the nerves to the rest of the body, right? But now I want you to think with me. Think a step further. What causes the electricity in the body? That's the question. Many people say it's electricity that produces thought, but what if it was actually the thoughts that was producing electricity? It's interesting, in the Bible, God is a spirit, right? And, and God created everything. It's the spiritual that creates the physical. So is it really so far-fetched to think that perhaps an, a, a spiritual thing, such as thinking, could cause electrical impulses in the brain? Is it possible? I don't know, right? What, what if it is, right? What if it is? Then what's the organ through which... Uh, the, the thoughts start in. Or it would be the mind or the heart, right? Or the spirit. And uh, there's, we can go into a whole lecture just on that by itself. But what if it's our thoughts? Now, you can see this. You can look at, at a brain scan and you can see different, uh, different parts of the brain that light up with electrical activity when there are different types of thoughts going on, right? What if it is the thoughts that produce electricity? Now, those things are spiritual. So here we can see right at the cellular level, we are both chemical and we are spiritual. And, and, and you can get all the chemical things right, but if the, if the problem is spiritual, as it is in 90% of disease cases, then we will be treating the person in an ineffective way. You can do all the right nutrition. You can eat a, a healthy diet and get lots of exercise. But if the problem is spiritual, it must be dealt with spiritually, right? Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. There's the body. 
and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, I don't understand it all, but some part of God's breath, some part of God's breath gave man his conscientious ability to think, what we call the mind, right? Before that, Adam was just dust. Now, when, when God formed Adam, he formed his stomach, he formed his eyes, he formed his lungs. Guess what? He also formed his brain. Adam had a brain, and when we die, our brains are still there. It turns to dust, right? God designed Adam's brain, and yet Adam did not have a mind until God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then the Bible says man became a living soul. Now, I love this quotation taken from Child Guidance, page 360. It says, all the physical organs are the servants of the mind. And the nerves are the messengers that transmit its orders to every part of the body, guiding the motions of the living machinery. So the physical organ, your brain is a physical organ. And all of our physical organs are servants to the mind. So is it possible that our thoughts can affect our chemistry? Oh, yes. And then you can scale that. This is a cell, but groups of cells working together form tissues. Groups of tissues working together form organs. And organs working together form systems. So if you have problems with your digestive system, you got to find out, is it the esophagus? Is it the stomach? Is it the small intestine, the large intestine? You know, what? Where is the problem? Is it in the mouth, right? Or if you're, you're, you have problems with, the, with your uh, cardiovascular system, is it the heart? Is it the blood vessels? What, what is, is the valves of the heart, right? So we have to look at, at the system and then we find out what is the disease organ, right? So in a diabetic, for example, um, oftentimes, uh, like in, a, in type 1 diabetes, the issue is the pancreas. It's either... Uh, burnt out and not able to produce enough insulin or it's just or sometimes it's an autoimmune condition they theorize that attacks the uh, pancreas and 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 it's not able to produce enough insulin to cover the needs of the body right so if the pancreas is the issue then we need to get down to the cellular level and find out is it a chemical issue what is causing the problem? Is it inflammation? Is it something, is something damaging the cells physically, chemically? And then on the other hand, we have to consider, is there something damaging the cells spiritually? So if the problem is with the pancreas, we got to find out, is it a chemical problem or is it a spiritual problem, right? Now, how do you determine if something is a spiritual problem? You see, we have to address what is the need of the body and what is the need of the mind, right? So the need of the body, well, what do you need to survive? Your cells require nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, right? Your, 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 your body has a operating temperature, right? You can't just uh, be out in the cold you'll you'll die right you can't be out if it's if it's too hot if you go in the oven at 400 degrees and fall asleep you'll die right because the body is the operating temperature but what else does your body have as a need right well it also needs electricity right in order to function and and what is the need of the mind when we look at the mind as being an organ that causes this electricity we, we can't just say, okay, the mind requires nutrition or oxygen. Although, yes, it, it's connected because the chemical is connected with the spiritual. But what is really needed by the mind? I want to show you a simple diagnostic question. What do you fear? This is where we start. What do you fear? Now, before I get into it, what does the Bible say about fear? You go all the way at Genesis, and you see this theme. Of course, there's the, the, the healthy fear, which is reverence, right? The fear of the Lord. Then there's the unhealthy fear, which is stress. Just like in stress management, we talk about use stress being the good stress. Like when you exercise, that's good stress. But then we also have what's called 
distress, which is the bad stress, right? When you're uh, when you're in a state of fear, anxiety, right? And and what does the Bible say? It always says, "Fear not," right? Uh, Joshua one nine. Jesus is telling Joshua, "Be not afraid." You fast forward to Isaiah forty one ten. Fear thou not. Fast forward. Gabriel's telling Mary she's pregnant. He says, "Fear not." You see, Jesus walking on the water. Disciples think it's a ghost. First thing Jesus says, "Fear not." Right? All through the Bible, fear not, fear not, fear not. Right? There's another verse in the Bible. Uh, it says here in 2 Timothy 1 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of, what's that word? Love and of a sound mind. So it's very interesting that you see God always says, fear not, fear not, fear not. Why? Because the spirit of fear does not come from God. Just like disease does not come from God either, right? The spirit of fear does not come from God. But instead, what does God give us? He doesn't give us fear. He gives us power and of love. And that's how we can have the sound mind. The sound mind, that's what we want. So we need power of love. And that's what gives us the sound mind. What else does the Bible say about fear? Well, let's look at it, right? If you have fears, it is evidence that you are deficient in perfect love. And that's because 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love does what? It casts out fear, right? It casts out fear. And and, and then it says even after that, Because fear hath torment. So fear is the thing that actually causes people pain and problems, right? Uh, It's the fear that God wants to cast out with his perfect love. And where does it come from? Where does perfect love come from? It can only come from God, right? So God gives the perfect love to cast out fear, right? Completely. So if we are fearing, it's evidence that we are deficient in perfect love. And how can we be deficient if God has enough? That's my question. Well, the question is, can you starve to death at a buffet? The answer is yes. If there's enough food, God has infinite love. He spreads out before us. But if we choose not to partake of that love, we will starve to death, right? Our minds will starve to death. And then what happens when we're when we're in the state of starvation because we're not taking love from God, we try to fill it by doing what? By, by, by seeking from another source, an illegitimate source, someone or something other than God. And, and there are so many people living in a perpetual state of fear, fear, anxiety. And, and these are the very things that could unbalance a mind. And the question is, can it then unbalance the body? Can a body respond negatively because of fear or stress now all this talk about love deficiency and fear taking a place of love the question is is there any science to that right can can we prove that the body actually does respond in a negative way well look at this little article here allergy asthma and clinical immunology and i know there's a lot of words in here so i just a piece out and basically they they talked about acute stress versus chronic stress and they looked at how acute stress may actually temporarily stimulate the immune system Um, for example when you exercise you're under acute stress right but they they found something interesting that chronic stress had the opposite effect it says here chronic stress dysregulates innate and adaptive immune responses by changing the type 1, type 2 cytokine balance and suppresses immunity by decreasing leukocyte numbers, trafficking, and function. In other words, your your immune system is in fact suppressed uh, and and the white cell activity is suppressed when there is chronic stress, or as the Bible calls it, fear. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. That's what God wants to do for us. Very interesting. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 17, 22, A merry heart doeth good like a 
medicine. But a broken spirit, notice what the Bible says, a broken spirit drieth the bones. And it's very interesting to me because if you look at the human anatomy and physiology, where does the immune system start? It starts in the bones, in the bone marrow. Your, your, your white cells, the soldiers that fight infections, they are formed right there in your bones. And so right here, the Bible tells us, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And if 90% of disease is in the mind, or has its foundation there at least, it would behoove us to take hold of Christ's strength. To, to, to take hold of the love of God, to accept it today. And, and, and I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to, to ask God, Lord, who is my source of love? And if it's not you, Father, I want to make you my one and only source of love. And I want to accept the love that you've offered to me through Jesus Christ. And when you accept that love, not just as, as an option, but as your only hope, you will find all that you need in God. You will find contentment like you've never experienced before in your life. And nothing can ever cause you to fear again because you are full of the solution, the love that God has poured out for you and I. And when our hearts are full of that love, we will never fear again. That's my appeal to you. God bless you. And thank you for joining us in this very special uh, event. And I pray that you will experience supernatural healing as you use these simple remedies and as you cast your burdens on the Lord and accept His love, His forgiveness, His, His everything, His life. And as you accept that into the heart, may true peace and true healing be yours. God bless you.